Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Calabresi, and it's my pleasure uh, to give the Whitaker Lecture as part of the 2020 CMSC meeting. First of all, I'd like to recognize John Whitaker, who was a remarkably accomplished MS investigator and also a good friend and mentor for me early on in my career. And I'm really privileged to give this lecture. I'd also like to thank the leadership of the CMSC uh, for inviting me uh, today to present. Here's the accreditation uh, designation uh, for CME. And these are my learning objectives. I would like to uh, review putative mechanisms underlying disease progression in MS. I hope that we will uh, come away with some knowledge about the oligodendrocyte precursor cells and potential for endogenous remyelination in MS. And then finally, I will touch upon uh, how we can incorporate imaging and promising blood biomarkers into patient care in order to monitor disease progression. These are my disclosures. And I'd like to recognize the many people involved in the clinical research arm of my presentation, including my co-director, Dr. Ellen Mowry, and many other people whose work I will cite along the way. In addition, I'd like to recognize the funding agencies, including the National Institutes of Health and the National MS Society for their gracious support of our work. Here are some of the faces behind the names that you just saw in our ever-growing MS Center. So I'll divide the talk into three parts. First off, we'll talk about CNS pathology because if we're going to understand how progressive MS works, we need to understand what are the cells and what kind of damage is happening. We'll focus on the different glia, the myelin of course, and how axons and neurons actually degenerate. Then I'll move on to talk about imaging, what we've learned of course from MRI, but also retinal optical coherence tomography or OCT. And then finally, we'll talk about promising biomarkers, including serum neurofilament and more recent work on extracellular vesicles that are enriched from cells in the central nervous system. When we think about MS pathology, first and foremost, we think about the peripheral immune system and an abundance of evidence supports the fact that T cells and B cells in the periphery recognize myelin or other autoantigens and traffic into the CNS and mediate the process. And of course, the success of our over 20 disease modifying therapies is much in part due to the ability to target those cells, delete them, prevent their activation or prevent their trafficking into the central nervous system. But what happens after they get into the CNS? And this is really important for understanding how MS plays out over years and decades after the initial immune infiltrates. The peripheral immune cells are likely to activate glia in the central nervous system, both microglia and astroglia, and as we'll see, probably also oligodendrocyte precursor cells. The glia, which normally serve a homeostatic function and uh, protect our nervous systems through mechanisms of including clearing of debris, uh, astrocytes provide synaptic support and take up uh, glutamate, which is neuroprotective. But when they become uh, activated inappropriately through chronic inflammation, they may take on neurotoxic roles and actually participate in the neuronal death and the death of oligodendrocytes causing demyelination. This uh, persistent demyelination then renders the axon susceptible to degeneration through a variety of pathways that we will talk about. And I hope you come away with this slide understanding that these cells are programmed and, and there for a reason to respond to injury. And the short-term response may be uh, beneficial, but sometimes the uh, compensatory mechanisms that ensue after chronic injury result in neurodegeneration and the ultimate demise of the, the system resulting in permanent disability. And understanding the details that underlie this hopefully will allow us to identify targets uh, that could translate into new therapies for progressive MS. And I think all of this is increasingly important in the era of viral pandemics like the one that we're in because uh, we need to think about how to target the non-immune aspects of MS um, especially for the many years uh, that uh, 
that people will be living with the disease. And some of these pathways, I think, uh, will ultimately involve therapies that don't uh, render people susceptible to infections. So when I think in the clinic about my uh, people with MS who are starting to progress, I think about those who have ongoing evidence of inflammation and are amenable to the disease modifying therapies. And we know, of course, relapsing remitting MS falls into that category. But then there are people who fall into a gray zone where they appear to be having progression in the absence of relapses. And we look to the MRI for evidence of microscopic new inflammation. And if people have new inflammatory lesions on MRI, we know that there's a lot of evidence supporting using disease modifying therapies in those folks. But what about patients who don't have relapses and don't have new MRI lesions, the so-called non-inflammatory progressors? What is happening in these types of patients? Well, first off, I fully uh, understand submit that there are patients who have microscopic peripheral immune-mediated inflammation that is causing damage to oligodendrocytes and axons. And we need ways of trying to understand if this is predominant enough to justify treating patients with higher efficacy immune modulating therapies. But we know from experience in clinical trials that many of our highly effective monoclonal antibody therapies don't have the same benefit in these types of patients. And so there must be other mechanisms. And indeed, chronic demyelination of nerves uh, leads to loss of trophic support to the axons and ultimately energy failure. This has been well described in the peripheral nervous system where heritable demyelinating neuropathies like Charcot-Marie tooth disease uh, are associated uh, with uh, ultimate uh, secondary axonal degeneration. So kids are born with aberrant myelin uh, in their peripheral nerves. And then 10 years later, they start developing disability because the axons start to uh, degenerate. And it's very likely that the same process is happening in MS where in the early plaque, there's relative preservation of axons. Uh, they're in a deprived state where they require more energy and can compensate for a period of time, perhaps months to years or even a decade, but ultimately the stress leads to their uh, death. And perhaps this is an opportunity to intervene either through remyelination or understanding the, these very energy uh, uh, failure pathways that I'm talking about. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned, the glia, which are normally homeostatic and providing support under chronic inflammatory conditions, become neurotoxic. And understanding the mechanisms by which these neurotoxic glia kill neurons and oligodendrocytes uh, offers an opportunity for intervention. And then finally, something that's been well described by pathologists but not talked about that much therapeutically is synaptopathy or the loss of synapses and connectivity between circuits in the brain. There's a lot of evidence from uh, imaging and pathology that this is happening, but how and why it's happening is just starting to be unraveled um, and again, may be amenable to therapeutic intervention. So why, why are all these processes so variable? Well, of course, we're not inbred strains of mice, and so environmental influences are likely impacting on the outcomes of our patients. Uh, we know that uh, infections can activate immune cells. We know that the microbial pathogens that live inside our gut are the directly interacting with immune cells in the gut and can influence our immune responses. There are likely environmental toxins, including uh, smoke and pollution that impact the health of our nervous system and the immune cells. And then of course, dietary factors, which are directly related to metabolism and energy. In addition, comorbid illnesses are likely to account for disease progression. We know that folks with metabolic syndrome, i.e. Uh, obesity, propensity to type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. These factors have been well described to influence vascular health, but now are increasingly being shown to relate to um, metabolic health and susceptibility to neurodegeneration. And we need to think about how to modify those factors. And then finally, it's very likely that there's a genetic influence to disease severity and disease progression. Most of the genetic studies ask the question who gets MS as compared to who doesn't. And we come up with immune genes 
it's been harder to ask the question about disease severity in a disease that plays out over decades. Uh, if you do cross-sectional GWAS experiments, most of your patients won't have reached their ultimate disability outcome and therefore may be under-reflecting how severe the disease is. And so increasingly their efforts to use imaging uh, as a tool to define the microscopic pathology early on in the disease uh, and then do a GWAS experiment to determine if there are genes that actually confer susceptibility. And we know in other diseases, for example, mitochondrial diseases, that these actually do uh, impact on outcomes. And if you take, for example, people with Harding's disease, which is the rare co-occurrence of MS and um, the labor's mutation, um, that we see that there's optic nerve involvement that is more severe. And this is also turning out to be true in some of the patients who have uh, CMT2A, which is the mitochondrial uh, mitofusin mutation, again, associated with axonal forms of heritable neuropathy. But it was described uh, recently that these patients can get an optic neuropathy and have axonal pathology in the central nervous system, suggesting that uh, a classical disease associated with, with mitochondrial dysfunction can impact on the pathology that we typically associate with MS. It's also likely that some of the genes that are being explored in frontotemporal dementia and ALS, which are both um, forms of axonopathies, uh, may end up ultimately having effects uh, as co-modifiers of outcomes in diseases like MS. So this cartoon depicts what happens when the healthy myelinated axon becomes demyelinated and how we get into this energy crisis situation. Normally, sodium channels are clustered at the nodes of Ranvier and facilitate saltatory conduction, which is an energy efficient process. The oligodendrocyte and the myelin provide trophic support to the axon, as mentioned, uh, both through the, the myelination, but also through the transfer of energy in the form of lactate through monocarboxylate transporters. In the acutely demyelinated situation, the loss of myelin is compensated for by redistribution of the voltage-gated sodium channels across the demyelin strip of the axon. And uh, this allows for conduction, but at a higher energy demand. And in the short term, patients recover both from the resolution of inflammation and due to these compensatory mechanisms, mechanisms as shown here with the redistribution of sodium channels. But uh, again, this requires uh, more energy. And so mitochondria traffic to the site of injury, they make ATP to help flux those um, ion channels and facilitate conduction. But eventually that system becomes taxed and leads to uh, energy uh, failure and uh, axonal congestion, conduction block, and eventually death will ensue. So understanding the molecular events in this process uh, could allow us to intervene before it becomes irreversible. This has been well described by pathologists in beautiful work from uh, Ranjan Dutta and Bruce Trapp at the Cleveland Clinic over a decade ago. They showed examples of myelinated axons at the ultrastructural level with normally spaced neurofilaments. Demyelinated axons can exist in a variety of states. They can be demyelinated with only minor uh, pathology to their um, ultrastructure. Specifically, we look at the neurofilaments and their spacing when the neurofilaments are phosphorylated in the myelinated state, they um, are normally spaced. In a demyelinated axon, they become uh, non-phosphorylated and their spacing is closer together, but they may exist in, in a relatively intact state, which is presumably a reversible functional state. However, in more advanced cases of more prolonged demyelination, one starts to see that the neurofilaments itself become uh, fragmented and in extreme cases barely detectable, indicating a potentially advanced or irreversible phase of axonopathy. How does this happen? Well, over a decade ago, a group from the uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Jeff Milbrandt and Aaron D'Antonio described mice that were called the Wallerian degeneration slow mice. This is a gain of function mutation that 
uh, prevented axons from unraveling, if you will, um, after transection, the so-called Wallerian degeneration. Being a gain of function mutation that wasn't targetable by drugs, but recently in a paper in Neuron, the same group was able to show that uh, after axonal transection, a molecule called SARM1 is activated and actually is the executioner of the axon. And we'll go through the molecular events that cause this to happen. But we now know that in a variety of different disease models, including inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, trauma, and metabolic toxins, that SARM1 is activated. And the concept here is that if one can inhibit SARM1, one might be able to rescue the axons in a variety of different diseases, including MS, ALS, and the other ones depicted here. So this cartoon depicts in more detail the process by which SARM1 is activated in an injured axon. First of all, uh, if you uh, look at the energy pathway, the precursors are uh, nicotinamide uh, and uh, NMN, which ultimately gets converted to the dinucleotide NAD, which is critical as an electron uh, donor and receiver in energy uh, metabolism. Normally, NMN gets naturally converted to NAD by an enzyme, NMN, adenyl transferase 2, which is uh, actively transported through healthy axons. In the disease setting, NMN and A2 is no longer transported and its levels drop, preventing the conversion of NMN to NAD. And this results in activation of SARM1. There's an immediate energy failure, but SARM1 turns out to actually be an NADase and further degrades the NAD and limits its availability. So it essentially shuts down energy uh, production in the axon in this injured state. And this of course leads to more rapid demise and raises the question about whether SARM-1 blockade uh, could actually be beneficial. And in fact, there are a number of papers now showing that uh, blocking SARM-1 or SARM knocking SARM-1 out is protective in peripheral nerves and uh, possibly uh, in central nervous system uh, axons as well. So in unpublished work using the EAE model, it has been shown that in the context of immune-mediated axonopathy as occurs in MOG peptide EAE, that there's quite a bit of axonal pathology. And in fact, this can be measured pathologically, but also by looking in the blood at the biomarker neurofilament light. And one can see in wild type mice that the levels of neurofilament go up around day 10 and peak between 15 and 20 days when we know a lot of axonal pathology is occurring in the EAE model. Interestingly, in the SARM1 knockout animals, one can see a fairly dramatic reduction in the release of neurofilament, suggesting that the depletion or deletion of SARM1 uh, is protecting axons in this model system. So this is very encouraging, not only from a basic science standpoint, but suggests that we might be able to use neurofilament as a readout for uh, testing the efficacy of small molecule inhibitors of this pathway. On the right, you can see that the heterozygous mice had an intermediate outcome suggesting a gene dosage uh, effect. Moving on to microglia, uh, Martina Ipsinta, when she was with Danny Reich at the NIH, published a series of beautiful papers showing that using imaging technologies, we might be able to start to detect uh, activation of microglia that are associated with degenerating lesions as opposed to those lesions which ultimately heal and repair. And we know that there's a heterogeneous response to the inflammatory injury in MS such that some people develop T1 black holes and other people fully uh, repair the lesion and sometimes can't even, one can't even see a, a T2 lesion um, residual footprint. And this speaks to the variety of outcomes in, uh, within a plaque and having an imaging biomarker of a early degenerating lesion would be extremely useful. And what Martina and Danny were able to show in these papers is that uh, patients who have phase rims, these so-called uh, dark areas, uh, this um, 
this imaging appearance demarcates uh, pathological accumulation of iron by the CD68 positive monocyte microglia at the lesion edge. And these uh, ultimately are the lesions that fail to repair. Patients who have phase rim lesions are more likely to have disability. Uh, and are, uh, again, these lesions are the ones that are probably less likely to repair as compared to the phase rim negative patients. If this can be operationalized in 3T imaging, uh, which is already being done, it might be a useful biomarker for clinical trials aimed at targeting the pathologic microglia to see if we could turn off the early stages of this degenerative process and facilitate lesion repair. Now moving on to astrocytes. A seminal paper was published in 2017 uh, by Shane Lidlow when he was in Ben Barris's lab. And this has promoted the notion that microglia when activated uh, by LPS make interleukin-1 alpha, TNF alpha, and C1Q, which together activate astrocytes in a pathologic way. Remember I told you that there are uh, normal, healthy homeostatic functions of astrocytes, but when exposed to chronic inflammation, such as these microglial mediated factors, the astrocytes appear to become neurotoxic. And the number one gene that they express as part of their neurotoxic transcriptomic profile is complement component C3, which is part of the classical complement pathway. And this is interesting because C1Q is right before um, C3 in this pathway. And the fact that microglia secreting C1Q can activate C3 positive astrocytes uh, uh, is consistent with what we know about the role of classical complement in mediating synaptic pathology. And what you can see in, in this slide here is that in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, this complement uh, production by astrocytes and ultimately opsonization or tagging of synapses may be going on as a response to a number of different types of injury in the central nervous system. But as you look on the far right, you can see that MS um, astrocytes seem to express quite a bit of C3. In a series of beautiful papers from Valeria Ramalia's group in Canada have shown that there is indeed C1Q and C3 deposition at synapses uh, in association with microglial processes, suggesting that the complement, again, tag synapses and then microglia, which have complement receptors, uh, may actually come along and mediate the stripping of that synapse. This process is developmentally wired in to allow synaptic pruning and promote normal somatotopic projection during development but in the state of chronic inflammation and disease where there may be aberrant, excessively high levels of complement expression, this process may become over exuberant and lead to essentially over pruning of the synapses and the demise of neurons. And indeed, as I mentioned earlier, pathologists have described that there is synaptic uh, loss in the MS brain and spinal cord. And here you can see one study that was published showing that in demyelinated lesions, there is a loss of spines um, and axons, but in the normal appearing gray matter, one can see that there um, is actually synaptic loss um, in the, the uh, cerebrum. And again, this same process has been described in the spinal cord, suggesting that an early precursor event to the demise of the neuron might be uh, the synaptic loss uh, leading to its lack of uh, connectivity. And uh, presumably this is uh, also causing symptoms in patients and, and might be a repairable phase of the process. Moving on to uh, another mechanism of injury. Uh, we talked about loss of myelin leading to loss of trophic support to the axon. There's of course a lot of interest in myelin repair and we know that it can happen naturally. And in fact, Pathologists have described that about 10%, maybe 20% of people with MS have evidence for partial remyelination. This is evidenced uh, by myelin stains with the so-called shadow plaques or, or light blue in this um, uh, blue myelin stain uh, 
picture on the right, one can see uh, geographic areas of partial remyelination. And in fact, uh, this would be very healthy and, and likely preserve the axons and facilitate not only their conduction, but uh, provide uh, trophic support and protect them from some of the, the degenerative processes that we've been talking about. So why does spontaneous remyelination frequently fail? We need to really understand that to uh, better target it for treatment purposes. Well, age may be an issue. Uh, Robin Franklin in the UK has nicely shown that in rodent systems that aged rodents don't remyelinate as well. There may be a problem with senescence of the precursor cells, the OPCs that turn into myelin producing cells. And perhaps if we can understand some of these senescent pathways in cells, we can make the OPCs uh, rejuvenate and facilitate their differentiation into myelin producing oligodendrocytes. We also know that the immune system is likely to impact on this and there are good and bad in aspects of the immune system. Macrophages are necessary for clearance of debris, but may also be uh, involved in uh, making inflammatory cytokines, which are injurious. The focus of our laboratory research has been looking at the microenvironment within an MS plaque and trying to understand how that becomes unfavorable to oligodendrocyte differentiation in a reversible fashion. No doubt when there's glial scar um, from uh, high alluronins and think versicans as V. Wee Yang has shown that this may be hard to um, reverse. Uh, of course, transacted axons are not going to be amenable to remyelination, but what if we could intervene in the early stages of uh, CNS inflammation that are actually suppressing the remyelination response and facilitate remyelination in that manner. Before I go on to show you our laboratory studies, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. The OPCs derive from neural stem cells. They uh, become uh, the precursor cell or what was called in this cartoon polydendrocytes when they take on uh, expression of the proteoglycans NG2 and PDGF receptor alpha. At this stage, they also express a transcription factor called SOX10, but uh, are not making myelin proteins. As they differentiate into an intermediate stage, they become O4 positive and lose the NG2 and PDGF receptor alpha surface proteins uh, and maintain SOX10, but again, are still myelin negative. And then ultimately, as they uh, become mature myelin producing oligodendrocytes, the uh, O4 will persist for a period of time, uh, but the, um, uh, they become MVP positive and again express other myelin proteins. Importantly, thinking about the timing of when the OPC show up in the context of immune cells, um, we see that, of course, in MS plaques that there are a lot of peripheral infiltrating immune cells, as we discussed. It's been known for decades that CD8s outnumber CD4s and B cells, uh, but have been somewhat, in my opinion, under uh, recognized. People like uh, Joan Government have been studying these for quite a while and highlighted their importance. In the periphery, CD8s may have regulatory functions, but within the central nervous system, these cytotoxic T cells are, are likely involved in um, killing uh, neurons and oligodendrocytes, and we need to understand their function. And indeed, right when the OPCs are recruited to the site of the lesion for repair, we see the presence of inflammatory cells. And it seems likely that these cells, the immune cells are inhibiting the successful remyelination. So as I said, the immune system uh, plays a good and bad role. There are some beautiful studies showing that monocytes uh, of the M2 phenotype that are making either immune suppressive molecules like TGF beta or reparative um, proteins, active in and insulin like growth factor may be important for healing. But at the same time, there is an abundance and probably more negative uh, effector immune cells that are inhibiting this process. And Vittorio Gallo, Brian Popko, Tim Vartani, and Richard Grantshoff and Jia Li have all shown that. Interferon gamma, IL-17, and TNF are in, uh, able to inhibit OPC differentiation until we turn that process off. I don't think that 
driving developmental OPC differentiation um, is going to work uh, as well as we hope. And in fact, uh, there's quite a bit of knowledge of the regulation of OPC differentiation, and this has led to uh, clinical trials with compounds to turn off some of the inhibitors of OPC differentiation or to promote their um, differentiation into mature oligos. And this all probably happens normally quite well during development, but in the setting of inflammation, uh, it starts to fail. So in, in order to better model this, we have combined two animal models, the traditional uh, EAE model in which there is myelin reactive T cell activation with cuprazone in which there is demyelination followed by remyelination. And neither of these models by themselves seems to be sufficient to study how inflammation suppresses uh, remyelination because in EAE, there is so much exonal pathology as I showed you earlier that there actually turns out to be much less successful remyelination because the axons are damaged. And in cuprazone, there's so little inflammation that the remyelination occurs very successfully in most of the animals. And all one can hope to do by testing a drug is to show that one can accelerate the remyelination process that happens normally in these animals. So by uh, demyelinating animals with cuprazone for four weeks and then adoptively transferring myelin reactive T cells into the animals in what we call AT coup for adoptive transfer cuprazone, we've been able to show that the myelin reactive T cells traffic to the brain instead of the spinal cord the way they do in normal EAE. They recognize the myelin antigens there and then they have a secondary effect in inhibiting OPC differentiation and remyelination. And these are the data to support the original animal model where we show that TH17 cells actually traffic to the brain better than TH1 cells as people have shown when they get to the brain, they actually become dual producers and make both IL-17 and interferon gamma, and that will become important for the later part of the story. Importantly, they do not mediate axon transections in the corpus callosum where the vast majority of the demyelination is occurring, uh, unlike in the spinal cord and classical EAE. And in the bottom panel using ultrastructure, you can see that the axons are smaller, but well-preserved and amenable to remyelination at later stages. Using a fate mapping system from my collaborator, Dwight Burgles, we've been able to track OPC uh, fate in an uh, estrogen receptor inducible uh, Cree line that's crossed with the reporter mouse um, that in which the uh, OPCs now will express a, a YFP protein. And uh, this has been used by uh, many investigators to fate map cells as they differentiate. And one can see here in the basal condition with no cuprazone that there are only a, a few YFP cells, but after cuprazone, one activates the OPCs, they proliferate and traffic to the site of demyelination. And you can see in the top right panel, uh, a, a robust uh, response of the OPCs that are YFP positive. And using co-staining, one can determine which of these uh, OPCs are in their immature state by NG2 positivity or which ones have matured into APC uh, or CC1 positive myelin producing cells. And when we did the fate mapping in the adoptive transfer cuprazone animals, we saw what we predicted that fewer OPCs actually are differentiating into mature oligodendrocytes at the two weeks post adoptive transfer there was about 50% um, reduction in the number of successfully differentiated cells. But interestingly, and, and we couldn't explain this initially, the absolute number of precursor cells was reduced when we adoptively transferred cells. And this is not what we predicted. It's known that OPCs are proliferative and when maintained in a proliferative state, um, they should be accumulating, not being reduced. However, um, the data uh, were repeated over and over again. And my graduate student at the time, Leslie Kirby, kept finding that there was a reduction in OPC. So we sought to transcriptomically profile the OPCs to better understand what might be happening uh, to explain their reduction. And uh, when she exposed um, OPCs to uh, T3, which is a differentiation factor, it's a thyroid hormone, um, or T3 plus 
the two cytokines that the T cells were producing, interferon gamma or IL-17, she saw a remarkable induction of a pathway called the cross-presentation pathway um, when they were exposed to interferon gamma, but not when exposed to IL-17. So in the top panel on the right, one can see that there's a reduction of myelin basic protein positive cells with both gamma or 17. The number of cells um, uh, that are expressing SOX10 stays about the same, but one can see induction with interferon gamma of canonical interferon gamma signaling pathway, including STAT1. But the critical subunits that are associated with formation of the immunoproteasome, which are uh, PSMB8, 9, and 10, and a reduction of the constitutive proteasome uh, subunit, um, PSMB5. And so what appears to be happening in OPCs is that they are converting from normal degradation of, of proteins in the proteasome to uh, a pathway that involves activation of the immunoproteasome whereby peptides are, um, are loaded onto class one molecules by a transporter called TAP1 and TAP2, and then uh, presented at the surface to uh, activate cytotoxic T cells. And this pathway has classically been described in professional antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells in response to viral pathogens and facilitates their clearance. Uh, by activating antigen-specific cytotoxic uh, T cells. But it came to us as rather surprising that the OPCs were able to actually uh, activate this pathway. And so we sought to see if this was functionally relevant. And indeed, through a series of experiments, which I don't have time to go through, um, we were able to show that OPCs um, actually do upregulate MHC class one and class two. They can activate cytotoxic T cells, which in turn kill the um, OPCs and thus are truly cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And this potentially explains the depletion of the OPCs, not only in our model system, but raises the question about whether this could also be occurring in MS plaques and account for the failure of uh, remyelination. We and other people of called these OPCs IOPCs for inflammatory OPCs. And we think that it's another example of how homeostatic functions of glia can be converted to injurious inflammatory functions that are probably wired into these cells to facilitate clearance of pathogens such as virus, but when activated long-term may have negative effects and uh, propagate disease such as an MS. And indeed, when we looked at MS tissues, we found that in the areas of demyelination and only in those areas, the PSMB8 was being expressed on SOX10 positive OPCs. And in the areas where the myelin was relatively intact, we did not see PSMB8 expression, uh, suggesting that the immunoproteasome was only being upregulated where there was failed remyelination. In this case, of course, there are residual OPCs that are able to express this. So not all of the OPCs are being deleted by CD8s. Uh, and it suggests the possibility and raises the question, could we target these cells and reverse the immunoproteasome pathway to facilitate remyelination? And um, in the paper that, that Leslie ultimately published, um, she was uh, able to test um, some of these pathways by looking um, both at TAP1 knockouts and using pharmacological inhibitors of the cells. So to summarize, in our hands and in other people's hands, interferon gamma suppresses uh, endogenous remyelination by inhibiting OPC differentiation. The OPCs express class one and cross present the exogenous antigen to CD8 cells, which become cytotoxic and ultimately kill the OPCs. And this involves activation of uh, immunoproteasome. Uh, and all of this potentially explains how there might be more CD8s in the brain because they're seeing antigen and expanding in response to antigen being presented by glial cells, including OPCs, and then ultimately propagating the disease further. As I mentioned, uh, Leslie was able to uh, use some pharmacological inhibitors that target different aspects of the immunoproteasome pathway that you see here. The positive control for these experiments was that uh, uh, peptide does not require processing uh, by the immunoproteasome and will activate T cells uh, 
if just presented to any antigen presenting cell, including OPCs. So in this situation, she was able to take OPCs from a transgenic mouse line that recognizes um, uh, ovalbumin and presents it um, on MAC molecule to activate ovalbumin reactive CD8 T cells. And so our readout was uh, activation of the so-called OT1 CD8 cells and their production of um, inflammatory cytokines and proteases. And the ovipeptide normally will, uh, the uh, ovipeptide can activate this pathway through a, the vacuola or pathway and don't require processing. So they, uh, the white bars are the positive control. And you can see with a variety of different inhibitors, including our, our new friend chloroquine, which is being tested in the, the, as an antiviral, actually inhibits antigen presentation. So, uh, in the pandemic of COVID-19, we need to uh, think about some of the drugs that, uh, that we're uh, using for MS and how they might uh, interface or interfere with some of the uh, putative therapeutics for COVID-19. This is a rapidly evolving field. And uh, a month or two ago, a number of people conceived of several different ways in, in which um, we might be able to pharmacologically target the COVID-19 and it raises a question about how this might impact um, people with uh, MS. So of course, preventing viral entry through interfering with the viral receptor, the angiotensin converting um, enzyme receptor uh, has been thought about. And uh, it, the, to date, the data regarding whether you're on an ACE2, uh, ACE inhibitor or not, uh, seems to not make a difference. And so far, no one has figured out a, a way, to my knowledge, of interfering with the, the viral entry into the cell. There has been discussion about interfering with antigen presentation, including uh, that was one of the putative mechanisms of hydroxychloroquine, as I showed you. And uh, I think that this might be a bad thing because you actually want the immune system to target and kill virally infected cells. So you, you actually would not want to block antigen presentation of viral antigen in the context of, of uh, a severe viral infection. Finally, uh, much has been made of the uh, immune response and the cytokine response. And indeed, there's quite a bit of evidence that the immune uh, cells and their re release products may be injurious to the tissues. But the question is still open as to whether this immune response is appropriate in, um, to the amount of virus that's in the lungs or whether it's an inappropriate response um, and a rebound, if you will, that should be dampened by immune suppressive drugs. And we don't know the answers to that question and there are ongoing clinical trials looking at JAK inhibitors and other immune inhibitors, anti-IL-6, uh, et cetera. But I think it's, it's very important to, to know the answer to this question as to whether the immune response is commensurate with the degree of virus and it's just trying, trying desperately to kill the virus or whether uh, it's an inappropriate excessive immune response that would be successfully uh, amenable to dampening and without rendering the host susceptible to more viral replication and perpetuating the process. And again, as we look at different places where chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine could interfere. Um, the, uh, it's been, it was postulated that it might uh, interfere with the viral receptor attachment, the endocytic pathway, as we discussed, and viral replication. Uh, however, unfortunately, to date, the, the data supporting the utility of uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have been mostly negative, whereas the antivirals, such as remdesivir, are the only ones showing an effect at this point. And as many of you have probably read, and some of these will ultimately be um, published very soon, uh, the uh, comparison of low dose versus high dose chloroquine showed that the higher doses were actually associated with more side effects and more lethality than the lower dose. And this speaks to the importance of equipoise in clinical trials, because I think there was an immediate assumption that chloroquine would be good no matter what. And in reality, perhaps there should have been a um, placebo controlled trial as well. And in fact, uh, with remdesivir, uh, there was a nice randomized controlled trial involving over 1,000 patients and showing a 31% faster time to recovery with a very strong uh, uh, trend towards survival benefit uh, on mortality, uh, which needs to be replicated. And now there are ongoing studies um, 
looking at combinations of antivirals, which I, I think is uh, definitely a, 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 the way to go here. So moving forward on to imaging biomarkers, let's review uh, retinal pathology in MS before we talk about OCT. It has been described that following optic nerve injury as an optic um, neuritis, that there's retrograde axonal degeneration ultimately resulting in death of the retinal ganglion cells. And in fact, R.E. Green in a seminal paper showed that 79% uh, of people um, with MS uh, had evidence for ganglion cell uh, layer dropout at postmortem. We, in a smaller sample size, have also seen retinal ganglion cell dropout. And in some of these tissues that are better preserved, we've been able to do concomitant immunostaining for microglia using IBA1 or astroglia with GFAP and see marked gliosis, not surprisingly. So there is microglial activation in the retina. Um, there's also um, astrocytic activation. And in other cases, we can see that the Mueller glia, which are the radial glia that, that cross the different layers of the retina are markedly activated. And of course, that's interesting because those are the cells that express um, potassium channels and uh, aquaporin-4. So can we image any of this? Uh, the answer is yes, of course. Using retinal uh, OCT, we can derive very high resolution pictures that give us a virtual biopsy uh, of the eye and then parse the layers uh, such that we can determine the thicknesses of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which are the axons that emanate from these ganglion cells. We can look at the ganglion cell layer itself in uh, conjunction with the plexiform layer, which connects it to the internuclear layer. And we can look at the deeper layers. And we and other people around the world have been able to show that there's thinning of these layers. And importantly, in this uh, international MS Visual Consortium uh, collaborative paper in which 879 patients uh, who had had an OCT evaluation uh, were looked at, and these are in non-optic neuritis eyes, so this speaks to the broader applicability of this uh, approach, even in the absence of optic neuritis. We were able to show that patients in the lowest tertile of nerve fiber layer thickness had the worst prognosis. And indeed, at year three, we're twice as likely to have disability progression. And uh, by five years, we're four times as likely to have worsening on the EDSS um, scale that we use to measure disability. So an OCT at baseline that's in the lowest tertile of thicknesses in this uh, case, less than 87 or 88 microns, predicted four times higher risk of disability progression. So using this kind of approach, we were able to re-ask the question about, are there genetic drivers of severity? Because as I said at the outset, it's been very hard to answer the question about whether there's, there's genetic susceptibility because for 10 or 20 years, a lot of people are compensating and have not accrued disability, but we know that this process of axonopathy and neuronopathy is happening at a microscopic level. So in this paper, uh, Kate Fitzgerald, who's on faculty with us at Hopkins, was able to calculate patient-specific slopes of retinal degeneration using our longitudinal data set and use that as a surrogate for the clinical uh, severity phenotype. And then did a GWAS experiment and found that classical complement pathway, specifically many C3 gene variants were associated with more rapid rates of retinal degeneration, implying that something about the regulation of C3 may be associated with this degenerative process. And indeed, in the context of what we know about C3 coming from astrocytes and C3 playing a role in a variety of other retinal diseases, including macular degeneration and glaucoma, this is biologically plausible. She also was able to confirm this data through a collaboration with the UCSF group in which they um, have a similar cohort and um, also found C3G variants were associated um, with this uh, process and looking functionally at loss of low contrast letter acuity by leveraging data from the COMBI-RX phase three clinical trial. She was able to show that Gene variants associated with C1Q and CR1, which are uh, in the classical complement pathway, were associated with loss of um, letter acuity 
uh, in patients enrolled in this study, which had a, a nice retention and longitudinal follow-up. So again, all of this potentially makes sense given what we know about complement. Developmentally, complement is there to facilitate synaptic pruning, as I mentioned, but in the setting of a chronic inflamed brain, there may be excessive production of the complement proteins, which tag synapses and lead to aberrant synaptopathy and ultimately neuronal demise. We've been able to look at some rare MS eyeballs and find patients who have extremely high levels of complement expression associated with GFAP positive astrocytes, but this is not happening in every patient that we've looked at. We've decided to model this in the Muring EAE uh, model using mod peptide in which we and others have shown that there's retinal ganglion cell dropout after following the optic meritus that occurs in these animals. We see that uh, indeed there is activation of uh, microglia and astroglia that's quite prominent in the EA animals. And then we've looked at C3 knockouts um, and um, I'm sorry, when, when we look at C3 expression itself, we can see C3 uh, retina and the murine retinas as we do in MS. And then in C3 knockouts, we actually see neuroprotection so that normally in EAE, there is loss of the retinal ganglion cells uh, in wild type mice, but if one induces EA and C3 knockout mice, there are significantly fewer retinal ganglion cells that have dropped out, suggesting that C3 is mediating um, this pathology and that by uh, deleting it, one can partially protect the retinal ganglion cells. Another group uh, recently published very similar data in immunity showing that um, uh, C3 is very important for uh, this synaptic stripping process. You know, they focused on the synapses in the, um, in the brain and uh, very nicely showed that if they delivered uh, an inhibitor of C3 using a um, AAV vector uh, that delivers CRRY, which is a, a known inhibitor of this pathway, that they could actually block the synaptic loss and preserve visual function in mice. So to summarize on the retinal neurodegeneration in MS and EAE, we know that there's retinal ganglion cell loss that occurs in MS independent of acute optic neuritis. It's been um, published in other papers that this uh, RGC loss mirrors global brain atrophy, so it's not just limited to the anterior visual pathway. C3 gene variants appear to be associated with more rapid rates of RGC loss, um, and C1Q and CR1 are associated with low contrast letter acuity loss. In knockout mice, they appear to be uh, protected from RGC loss, suggesting that C3 is critical in this pathway. Uh, and this suggests that in, uh, inhibiting uh, this pathway may be involved in inhibiting regeneration by excessive pruning of uh, sprouting um, RGCs. So moving on to biomarkers, everyone's familiar with uh, neurofilaments, uh, we talked about them in the context of ultrastructure, but neurofilament light specifically can be measured quite accurately um, in the spinal fluid and now in the serum. It's been known for over a decade that in the context of axonal injury that there is release of neurofilament light uh, that can be measured with, uh, in high amounts in the spinal fluid, but using single molecule assay, small assay developed by Quantirix, uh, people have been able to measure this in the bloodstream and a number of papers have shown very promising results that this could be used as an indicator of tissue injury. In fact, um, in the context of uh, phase three clinical trials where serum has been saved, we were able to uh, parse patients into different groups uh, based on their expression profiles of neurofilament. And in patients who had consistently high levels of serum neurofilament over a one year period, this measured every three months, uh, th these patients were much more likely to have new T2 lesions at four years and have uh, greater brain atrophy um, on MRI as compared to the patients who had consistently low neurofilaments. And reassuringly, the expected responses to immune therapies have been seen with neurofilament as a biomarker such that in placebo, there's no significant change in neurofilament over a 48 week period. However, uh, in uh, treatment with pegylated interferon beta 1A, there was a 15% reduction in the proportion of patients who had elevated neurofilament at 
baseline as compared to week uh, 48 on treatment. And with natalizumab, uh, again, consistent with its known stronger effect, there was a 26% reduction of patients who had elevated neurofilament levels. And I think this uh, data is very important, suggesting that even if you have high levels to begin with, uh, that uh, if you return to a lower level six months later, uh, this indicates a good treatment response. So again, um, in this, uh, in the advanced study of pegylated interferon beta, those patients who had high neurofilament, i.e. above 16 picograms per mil, but dropped to the low level, had significantly better outcomes at year two, uh, year two with uh, looking at the number of t new T2 lesions, uh, also looking at uh, brain atrophy where they had less brain atrophy. And uh, importantly, at year four, their EDSS change was less than the group that had sustained elevation. So this suggests um, as a biomarker in the clinic that uh, we would uh, try to treat patients with the high levels of neurofilament and those who came down uh, are likely to be doing better. And this could allow us to measure the efficacy of not only the immune drugs, but moving forward to potentially test neuroprotective drugs. However, I think neurofilament is likely telling us uh, mostly information about inflammatory axonopathy. And what we and other people are starting to see in progressive MS is that the levels drop down again as you have fewer axonal transactions. And so there is a great need to develop biomarkers of the secondary mechanisms of uh, progression we've been talking about um, in this talk. Uh, and a very exciting approach to this has been measuring in the blood extracellular vesicles that are enriched for CNS cells such as neurons or astrocytes. And the way this is done is that these extracellular vesicles, when they blab out of cells, carry some of the membrane of that cell of origin and using an antibody, one can pull down extracellular vesicles that are relatively enriched for neurons uh, or astrocytes. And using this approach, uh, Pavan Bhargava and our group has been able to show that people with MS have reductions of synaptic proteins that are inside the neuronally enriched extracellular vesicles, suggesting indeed that there is a uh, process going on where there is a reduction of synapses and being able to measure this in the blood could be extremely useful in quantifying when it occurs and whether it could be responsive to therapy. And interestingly, in these very same patients, but now pulling down on extracellular vesicles that presumably are enriched for an origin from astrocytes, he was able to show that there's an increase in the complement protein C1Q uh, and C3. And looking at the ratios in these same patients, one can see that the um, complement is inversely correlated with the uh, synaptic proteins, uh, suggesting that the, there might be some connection here. So in those patients who have uh, reduction in the neuronal synapses, there were higher levels of complement proteins potentially linking these two um, mechanistically. So with that, um, I think I will stop. I recognize the many talented people uh, in my lab and, and my uh, good collaborators who participated in the laboratory research that I showed you. And I thank you very much uh, for your attention. I think this is a incredibly promising time through decades of, of basic science research. We've started to unravel the mechanisms that underlie progressive MS. We're starting to develop targets and we're in a position where we can test them through imaging and uh, blood biomarkers. Thanks so much for your attention and I hope you have a great day.